woke up this morning with 23 reasons to be excited to be here, but uh, the principal reason that I want to bring and underscore to you right now is one of motivation. Today's class is part of a series I'm doing on when Paul, the apostle, the rabbi Paul, got arrested in 57 AD. If I had been hired to be his lawyer, how would I have defended him? Now, his arrest is one where his life is on the line. He wasn't arrested for fear that, you know, it's not like, hey, you're going to do seven days in jail or 140 hours of community service. This is one where his life is on the line. And it's a very serious case for me to take on if I were going to do it. And so I've been studying this with you out loud. And we're at a point this morning where we're going to talk about Paul's motivation. What Paul wanted in the case. If you got the written lesson, I sent you the, the written lesson with a different introduction than I want to use for, for the actual oral lesson. And uh, there is a written lesson available to everybody. But, but I want you to focus on... What drives you in the decisions you make? Big decisions and little decisions. What is it that drives you? What is it that motivates you? What is it that turns your engine? And, and the reason I'm asking this right now and the reason I'm changing the introduction a little bit is because I got a call from a, a woman named Brenda Sapina Jeffries. She's a reporter for the Texas Lawyer. And she called me on, on Friday after I'd already written the, the lesson that got emailed out. She called me on Friday and she said, I'm writing a story for the Texas Lawyer. I don't know how many of y'all read the Texas Lawyer. It's probably <laughs> none. And I'm writing a story for the Texas Lawyer about everything that's going on in Charlottesville. But my specific angle is some law firms and some lawyers have come out with statements. And she said, I know you to be a Christian. And I'm wondering what you think about lawyers coming out and making statements about what happened in Charlottesville. Well, I'll expand it beyond Charlottesville. I'll also talk about what happened in, in Spain and Barcelona. I'll talk about what's happening all over the world. I'll talk about the aftermath of Charlottesville and all of the, the issues associated with that. But I want to tell you what I told Brenda first. I said, Brenda, we, we lawyers walk a tight rope on this. Because as a lawyer, we've got a perspective and we've got some important things maybe to say. But we also have to be careful that we're not simply talking to let the world know, look at me as a lawyer. I'm not a racist. Or look at me as a lawyer. I've got something positive to say. The motivation behind why we might talk about something is just as important as what we have to say about it. And so I'm, I, I, I'm not, I, I, I said, if, if I had a forum where my voice made a difference, if I was a lawyer in that area of the country, or if I was a lawyer being interviewed on TV, or if I was a lawyer who, was speak, who, who specialized in those issues, then that might be a really good thing for me to let the world know where I stand. I said, from my perspective, the only reason I might say something and the format where I would say it would be in this class because I've got the blessing and not only of having my family and extended believer family here, but the blessing of an internet team that puts this live cast on Facebook as it's going and unfolding and then uh, uh, in an archive on the internet for people to watch at any point in time. And so there is an audience that may want to hear where I stand on this. And so motivation is absolutely critical. Now having said that, I want to tell you where I stand on this. It breaks my heart. You know, we are 
first and foremost, a community of faith. But our community of faith is not a Rotary Club, and, and I love the Rotary Club. My wife loves the Rotary Club. I did not say anything negative, Becky, about the Rotary Club. But we are not a Rotary Club. We're meeting in a gymnasium, but we're not a health club. We're a community of faith that truly believes that the one God in some way that defies our understanding became human. And when Jesus was born, a declaration was made of peace on earth and goodwill toward all people. And that's what we believe in. And that's what Jesus gave his life for. And I believe that he, he died and was resurrected again in power to bring us peace with God, which then sets us on a mission or course of explaining that peace and bringing that peace to this world. Now, that's what we're about. That's what I'm about. And when I see hatred, when I see divisiveness, when I see exclusivity, when I see categorization, I see a need for the gospel that transcends all of that. The God I understand and worship is not the God of Islam who only loves his people. The God I love and understand is the God of all who loves everyone and doesn't want anyone to come to ill, but wants everyone to come to the saving knowledge of what Jesus did for them. And my goal is not to find people of another... Amen for God. Amen for God. My goal is not to find another group of people and annihilate them so that God will give me virgins when I get to heaven. If we get wives in heaven, I'm happy with the one I got here. More than happy. She doesn't want me to say it, but today is our wedding anniversary. She can't get mad at me. It's a wedding anniversary. I'm just so excited to be married to my best friend. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, my goal in this life is to share the good news to everyone. You want an answer to radical Islamic terrorists? The best answer I can give you is let's win them to Jesus. And let them see that there is something worth dying for, but it's not killing the infidels. It's preaching the Lord. And I can't think of a better tie-in to the lesson this week because one of the biggest problems I have when I represent people is figuring out what they want. You know, you get there and you've got, you've got this road in front of you. Okay, my remote did not advance your slide. It advanced mine. I'm going to try it again. My remote is not advancing your slides. Thank you. You've got, if, if let's see if it works. It still does not work. So here's what you're going to have to do. You may have to manually advance your slide, and I'll just kind of give you a, okay? So everybody's going to, who's watching the Internet that comes in late, they're going to wonder, man, Mark's into it today, man. Bam! <laughs> Boom! Okay. All right, we got it? We got our communication channel. Thank you so much. One of the most difficult things is finding out what people want in the case. I've got a case going on right now where a race car driver ran over another race car driver and killed him. And the parents are just tragically hurt. And I asked the parents what they want. Well, well that's the hard question. What do you want? Good. They want their son back. And I can't give them that. Well, then they want the other race car driver no longer racing. Well, I, the court doesn't do that. Courts are good at throwing people in jail or setting them free. Courts are good at awarding money or not awarding money. 
But there's a limit to what the court can do. And so that's always the hard question. What do you want? And that is the motivation issue. And so I ask myself, if I've got Paul as a client, I need to know what does he want? What's his motivation? Does Paul want freedom? Maybe. Freedom is a typical motivation for someone, especially when they're facing capital punishment. Maybe he just says, Mark, I just want to be declared free. No. Maybe he wants fame. Fame is another one. Some people just, hey, better to burn out than to fade away. My, my, hey, hey. Neil Young. Give me, give me the moment, man. It was a bright light, but uh, yeah, it fizzled. But man, did you see how bright it was before it fizzled? Maybe the motivation is money. Maybe he's looking for, you know, I've got clients who want the money. And I, that, that can be a bad motivation, but that can also be a good motivation. I mean, some people have been robbed and they deserve the money. Some people need it to live on. And they've been robbed of their ability to earn a living. And so I, I, I'm not throwing rocks, but that, that for some people is the motivation. For some people, the motivation is, is easy street. I just want my life to be comfortable. And my motivation in this world is simple. What's going to make my day the best day it can be? How can I enjoy today? How can I get rid of stress? How can I get rid of worry? How can I have a day of sigh where my belly is full, my bank account is green, my children are dancing properly. My wife loves me, and I don't fear for tomorrow. I want easy street. Now, those are all kind of self-interested motivations to make my life better. Some people have a different view of life. As Louis Miori says, there are all kinds of people, and the church are full of them. And I think he's right. So some people, the motivation might be self-destruct. I have met people on a course of self-destruct, whether because of a poor self-image or for some other reason I'm not smart enough to understand, they're seeking to make their life miserable. It's almost as if what's important to them is being pitied by people. And so they, they, they live a life so that people feel sorry for them. Lots of motivations. And for some, for some there's another motivation. There's what I would say is a higher calling. These are the people who have something beyond simply themselves as the center for how they make their decisions and what they do. Now, I truly believe Paul is one of a higher calling. I think that was his motivation. I got to tell you, if I examine the motivation of Paul, what you would typically expect of him if he came to me as a lawyer and said, Mark, represent me, please. I would typically expect when I ask him the question, what do you want, him to say, I want my freedom. Get me out of the trap. They can keep the cheese. Just let me go. You know, you might be saying, nah, you know, maybe Paul was one of these guys who uh, liked the idea of jail. There's a certain security in, in a roof over your head, a couple of square meals. Uh, you know, you don't have to go to work. They don't say, you know, why aren't you at work? Well, I can't. I'm in jail. 
You know, you're kind of like got a built-in excuse, kind of like when you're sick enough to where you're, you're not going to die, but you are so sick, you really just can't go to work. You know, you've got that moment. No. I want to tell you that a Roman imprisonment was no Mayberry jail cell where Otis would go and lock himself up after he'd had too much to drink and Andy and, and Barney are going to be there and Aunt B's bringing by the apple pie. Roman imprisonment was very different. If, for example, you were to look at the, the prison where Paul was interred before his death, at least according to church history in Rome, it's called the Mamertine Prison, and you can go see it today. But if you'd give me an advanced slide, that's the Mamertine Prison. It was, uh, it's got meters thick stone, and it's a hole in the ground. And you get lowered down through a hole. And it's kind of a round thing. You see, Rome never had prisons that were meant for long-term stays. Prison was not a punishment. Prison was a holding until you got punished. Your punishment would typically be a loss of citizenship if you were a citizen expulsion from the Roman Empire out into the hinterlands. But more likely than not, if it was a serious offense, your punishment was death. They got rid of the lawbreakers. So it wasn't, gee, five to ten years for, you know, doing that crime. No. Prisons were simply a holding cell. The punishment was assessed, and when the punishment was assessed, it was administered swiftly. And the punishment was never incarceration for a period of time. When you were in jail, you did not get three square meals. You did not even get slave rations. The best you could hope for was one half of slave rations. Not enough food to live on. You relied upon friends and family to bring you food in prison. I mean, when Jesus said, when I was in prison and you visited me not, uh, that was a huge deal. That wasn't simply family day. If, if you did not go take care of community that was locked up, or friends or family that were locked up for some reason, there's a really good chance they would not survive. Because the, the, the rat infestation, the bug infestation, the disease infestation, the lack of food, the lack of sunlight, and oh, did I mention, for a lot of this you're chained up. If you'd give me a slide. This is not Mayberry. Paul's not going to want to just hang around because, hey, three square meals and a roof over my head. So when I ask that hard question, what do you want, you might expect Paul's answer to be an obvious, give me freedom. But no. I don't think he would. Because something unique happened with Paul's life. And you can kind of see it unfold if you carefully look at the story in Acts and you examine Paul's life up until that. You certainly see witness to it for what happens to Paul afterwards. But, but Paul made a discovery. The discovery that Paul made was this. Paul, if you would advance my slide please. Paul's discovery was this. Paul got to talk to high Roman rulers about Jesus being the Messiah. I mean, pause for a moment here. One of the hardest things I've ever done as a father was uh, uh, when each of our kids became a senior in high school. Uh, I tried really hard. I, I've traveled a lot professionally, and, and as a result, my kids have sacrificed dad time in some ways 
over their lives. And, and I've told each of them when they became a senior in high school, I wanted to do a father-son or daughter trip. Just the two of us. Let's go somewhere special. And all of the work that I've done as a lawyer, I'll try to bring to bear to make that trip exactly what they'd like it to be so that they felt like they were involved in what I've done as a lawyer. And it, it was a great joy. I commend it to any of you to do with your children or your grandchildren or something like that. Just a delightful time with each one. And each chose something very unique and different. And most of them were really sensitive to me and what I'd be able to do. And so uh, uh, Will uh, wanted to go to Cancun and just enjoy the beach and just be in together for a couple of days. And that was, that was good. And, and you know, Rachel uh, uh, wanted to go to Nashville and, and uh, 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 have a chance to do a couple of things there. And, th and that was all real, really good. Well, we got to our last child, Sarah. And Sarah sees the world in a unique way. She's a, a, a special, marvelous child. But I said to Sarah, Sarah, I said, uh, what would you like to do? You know, we got to plan your senior trip with Dad. And she says, well, Dad, I, I know I probably couldn't meet my hero, but if I could just be in the same room with my hero, I would, I would, I don't know, it would be the best day of my life, other than meeting Jesus. She's, she's a good kid. And so I said, uh, I said, okay, and I'm thinking, Lord, please, will Becky have done a good enough job as her mom to where her hero is not Justin Bieber <laughs> or Beyonce. And Justin Bieber and Beyonce, if you're watching, love you guys, man. <laughs> Just didn't want to intrude. Um, please. And so I said, well, honey, who is your hero? Who's your idol? And she said, well, you know the answer to that. German Chancellor Angela Merkel. I'm like, oh yeah, of course. Excuse me. Of course, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Well, how in the world am I going to pull that one off? You know, the idea of getting to talk to a high government official is not easily done. The idea, if I said to you, you've got a chance to talk to probably the leader of Europe, the German equivalent of President Trump, Vice, or not Vice, Chancellor Angela Merkel. I mean, that's a pretty unique opportunity. If I told you, you have an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one to President Trump whether you like the guy or don't like the guy. It's a pretty stunning thing. I mean, for a lot of people, if I told you we're going to have Greg Abbott come to class, our governor in Texas, and he just wants to meet you, and you're going to have one-on-one -on -one talk time with him, that would be a pretty big deal. Paul had an opportunity because of his arrest and the, 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 the rioting and the efforts to kill him in Jerusalem, Paul got shipped to the procurator of Rome. And Paul got to visit with him. Look at the timeline again. Let's make sure we're all on the same page because maybe your Roman history is not as up to date as it should be. But that's okay. You have a nerd up here teaching. And I love this stuff. So here you go. Let's put up some dates. 40, 50, and 60 A.D. Throw the next clip, please. 40, 50, 60 A.D. That's our time frame we're looking at. From 41 to 54, the head of the Roman Empire was Claudius. He was Caesar. Claudius Caesar. He was the emperor. He's the number one. He's the guy. Okay? He dies in 54 A.D. by his wife. Wasn't a good anniversary for him. <laughs> and Nero, his like grandnephew or something, the turned adopted son, becomes emperor. Nero was a nutter, by the way. N-U-T-T-E-R. Nut case. But Nero becomes emperor as a young fella 
in 54 AD. Now, the Caesar, the Roman emperor, appointed the rulers for each of his areas, his provinces, his divisions. And he would give them what was called imperium power. He would give them the power of being Caesar in that area. That person was accountable to Caesar. If they did their job right, they lived. If they did not do their job right, they could forfeit their life, their citizenship, or any number of different things. So Cuminus was Rome's procurator or the imperial holder or Caesar's representative for Judea and the surrounding area. From 48 to 52. But because he did not handle the Jewish disturbances and the, the uprisings that were happening in Jerusalem and surrounding areas in Galilee, because he did not handle them well, he got canned. He got sent out of the Roman Empire. He was stripped of citizenship and he was exiled. And Claudius, the emperor, put in his place, if you'll give me my next one, Felix. Antonius Marcus Felix. That's who is Rome's procurator. That's who Caesar's representative at the time that Paul gets arrested in 57 A.D. So Paul is making his appearance before Caesar's representative, Felix. This is a big deal. Felix is not just nothing personal, Mayor Turner. He's not just the mayor. He is the representative holding imperium power for Caesar. Also interesting, Felix is holding it for a Caesar that didn't appoint him. See, he was appointed by the previous Caesar. And every new Caesar wonders if their appointments are still going to be loyal. Because you appoint people loyal to you. So you've got this situation. Now let's talk about Felix for just a moment. Marcus Antonius Felix. I tried to find a picture of him from the internet. But I'm not sure that Google Image <laughs> brought up the right picture of Felix. So um, uh, uh, I looked a little bit further past my first Felix. And I got instead a coin. But I knew he wasn't on a coin. And you research the coin. And while that talks about the prefect of Felix in Judah. IVD is Judea uh, uh, in Latin abbreviated. Uh, they didn't have a U. They used a V. That's why when you put two V's together, by the way, you have a double U. Because the U is a V in Latin. Okay? Uh, because they were chiseling these things in stone. Try to chisel a U. It's just not that easy. A whole lot easier. Bam, bam. Two hits, you got a V. Okay? So that's I-V-D or I-U-D in our English language. Judea. Um, but that's not a legit coin. That was done in the, the Renaissance uh, by somebody who was looking to make famous coins and has no idea what the guy looked like. But he did mint coins. But the coins he minted, he being Marcus Antonius Felix didn't have his picture. They had, you can make out on the right side, the back side of the coin, it says Nero, N-E-R, and then under the second line you've got what looks like a W, but that's an omega, N-O-S, or what looks like a C. That is Nero's name. And then on the left side you've got, start, you see that K, that K on the left side that goes up, K-A-E, that's the start of, it's kind of rubbed out, but that's Kaiser. That's Caesar. Caesar Nero. But the coin was minted by Felix. I mean, this is not some small dude. He's the one who's minting the coins for Caesar in Judea. So with that as an understanding, understand that Felix was not just appointed by Caesar, but we need to know a little bit more about him. He was married three times. And he always married up. He, he married uh, 
better, better women than he was. Tacitus said the following about him. Antonius Felix practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of a king. That's what he had. He was Caesar for Judea. Wielding the power of a king with all the instincts of a slave. He had married Drusilla, the granddaughter of Cleopatra and Antony. And so was Antony's grandson-in-law. Now Tacitus may have messed up a little bit in his history. Some people think that Drusilla may have been the name of, of Cleopatra's granddaughter. But um, the odds are Tacitus mixed it up because Felix had three wives. But we know that his wife Drusilla was a different Drusilla. And so there was a Drusilla that he was married to later, if you'd give me the next, thank you, who was Jewish and married to the king of that area, King Agrippa. You might be saying, well, how do they have a king? With, we'll explain that when we get to Agrippa next week. But Drusilla is Jewish. She's married as a late teenager and becomes the second wife of Felix. By the way, interesting note, Drusilla died in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii, 79 AD. I just threw it up there, thought, hey, what, why not? Okay, so here's what you've got. You've got Marcus Antonius Felix, who's married to a Jewish gal of Jewish royalty, who's known for marrying up, known for being cruel, got his job because the previous guy didn't do his job well, but is under a ruler that's precarious at best, Nero, in his disposition, and hadn't been appointed by Nero. This is the man who holds Nero's power, and Paul has a chance to talk to him about Jesus. Do you think Paul wanted his freedom? Oh, I'm sure he did. But it paled in comparison to the chance to talk about Jesus. So I want us to look at the way Paul defended himself and what Paul had to say because it's really, it's really incredible. It's 24.10 is where it starts. Acts 24.10. So the, the indictment against Paul has just been made. The lawyer Tertullus for the Jews has, has just a Jewish establishment. I need to be careful Paul's a Jew. Um, uh, uh, has just given the case against Paul. And the governor, that's the translation given here for the procurator, Felix. But he's much more powerful than we think of as governors. He is Caesar for Judea. So I, I, I get nervous over that translation governor. Um, is that as fuzzy to you as it is to me, or is that just because I took off my glasses? Is it fuzzy? Okay, there. Look how Paul starts. I mean, there's a lot of people who would start with... <laughs> stammering. You remember my cousin Vinny when the other little lawyer got up there, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Uh, that happens. Not Paul. Paul's motivated. And I want to show you just one envelope of his motivation. Well, let's open it up together. By the way, if I want to share something important with you, how important is it that we have a relationship? It's important, isn't it? A bond. Paul speaks with the governor, the Caesar. Paul speaks with Felix on an intimate, personal basis. He doesn't talk to... Uh, uh, Paul's not cowered by this man. Paul is emboldened to approach this man as any human being in spite of his position. Because when you know who God is on his throne and what God has done through Jesus, any other human being you meet is just a human being who needs Jesus whether they carry the label of POTUS or whether they are the president of Russia or the 
dictator of North Korea. They are an individual before an almighty God. Paul says, knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. I love that. Do you know why? Do you know what the Latin word is for cheerful? <laughs> Felix. Paul makes a pun off of his name right there at the beginning. He basically says, hey, Mr. Cheerful, I cheerfully make my defense. And then he starts talking to him about Jesus. And he starts talking to him about the way. And he starts talking to him about how he worships the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the Torah and written in the Nevi'im, the prophets. About the hope that's in God, which these men themselves accept, that there's going to be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. He says, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. And so here's what I did. And he, and he walks down and he walks through what all happened. Now, Paul, let's go back to the PowerPoint for a moment. Paul, if you look at it, is speaking to a, a one in great power and authority. If you had said to Felix, who's your boss in the chain of command? Do you know who it was? Caesar Nero. There's not, oh, he's the ultimate president of the company and I'm on layer seven. No. He's appointed, I I'll tell you this. Well, well, we'll get to it later. We're not even remotely getting through this today. I'm sorry. But next Sunday, I hope you'll come back because I really am excited to get to finish this lesson with you. Because this is so very important to see Paul's motive. See, Paul had a chance to get out. Felix, give me my next thing. Felix was keeping Paul around and talking to him and was ready to let Paul go if Paul would just sort of pay him a fine. That's a polite way. It's basically, hey, judge. Can I go? Now, we look at a bribe today and we say that's horrible. Of course, Paul wouldn't bribe him. Bribes weren't that horrible back then. <laughs> that's part of how these guys made their money. <laughs> they would consider it court costs, to use, a <laughs> to, use, to use a phrase we might be familiar with. But Paul never paid the fine because he was getting called back and called back and called back and is getting to talk to Felix and his Jewish wife. So you got a pagan and a Jew. And Paul's getting to tell them both about Jesus. Go back to the text if we can. Look what happens. Felix, having a regular, rather accurate knowledge of the way, put off the Jews that were trying to get Paul indicted, gave orders to the centurions that Paul should be kept in custody but have some liberty. That's bizarre. That none of Paul's friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. Medical food, Bible. After some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. He reasoned as he reasoned as Paul reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Felix got alarmed. He's hitting the buttons. Felix says, uh, go away for the moment. Get a little hot in here. I'll call you back. 
go away for the moment. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon you. At the same time, he hoped money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. Then two years later, he got fired because the Jews went to Rome and complained about it. Not simply for Paul, there were other things. So when two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, they're the ones who got him fired. He left Paul in prison. Um, Paul's motivation. We go to the next slide. Paul's motivation was a higher calling. He wasn't working for his freedom. Now next week, what I want to do is, we're going to go through these just bam, bam, bam. We're going to consider Paul in Athens. We're going to talk about him in the Agora. We're going to talk about what happened in the Agora with the Epicureans and the Stoics. You're going to have a ball with that one. We'll talk about who Epicureans were. Bam, 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 just keep flipping, keep flipping, make them come back. Bam, 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 materialist, non-emotion, blah, 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 Spock. Yeah, you're going to like that slide. You'll laugh when you see it. And we'll talk about Acts 17, 18 and what happened with Paul there and, and how Paul dealt with the Epicurean and Stoic view. Bam, 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 keep going, bam, bam, bam. We're, and, uh, bah, 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 and we're going to talk about this, now all of that next week. Keep going, bam, 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 bam. I told you we weren't going to get through this today. Bam, 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 bam. Points for home. I forgot to advance my own. <laughs> um, okay, so here we are. Points for home. Knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. I love that. Paul knew and understood the importance of relationships. We want to change this world. We want to stop Charlottesville. We want to stop North Korea. We want to stop the radical Islamic terrorists. We want to stop the radical left, the radical right, the radical anything. We want to stop the non-radical pacifist who's doing destructive things. We want to, you want to change the world? Make relationships based in Jesus and share Jesus. That's the real solution. It's not, I'm glad I'm not president. It's not the political solution. But there's part of me that just wonders, you know, where we as the church can engage in telling people that there can be peace in this life. And if you've got peace in your own life and you know who God is and you know who Jesus is, heaven help you if you don't show and share that peace with others. The importance of relationships, we need them. And it fits hand in glove with what David was saying. Okay, next point for home. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. This is funny, poignant, and sad all rolled into one. You know why? Because Paul was offering Felix something so much more valuable than chunks of metal. Paul was offering him something money cannot buy. I don't care if you give money in the collection plate. It doesn't buy you peace with God. Peace with God comes through the sacrifice of Jesus, Messiah. Who pays a price for our sins so we don't have to. Who draws us in love into a relationship with God. If that's historically true, which I believe with all of my life. There's not any amount of money in the world that's worth that. Why on earth would we want to settle for money when we could have eternity with God? Last point for home. This is when Paul's talking to the Athenians, so this is one for next week. But we'll talk about it briefly. God is actually not far from each of us. For in God we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets, those are the Greek poets, have said, indeed we are his offspring. The Epicureans tried to, to find happiness through 
lowering their expectations. Just don't expect too much and you can find happiness and live for it. The Stoics tried to find happiness by getting rid of emotion. But they all wanted this happiness. And what Paul told them is the greatest happiness is going to come from finding God. Not lowering your expectations. Not getting rid of your emotions. But finding the one who made you and calls you. And it's my prayer that we will have that happiness here to people who hear this message. So thank you. I went four minutes over. I apologize for that. But can I bless you in the name of Jesus? And then we'll come back next Sunday, I hope. Father, thank you so much for my friends that are here today and for anybody listening to this message through the wonders of technology. I pray that you will bless them, Father, that you will bless them with peace that comes from knowing you and being in an intimate relationship with you through the salvation and and blood of Jesus. Father, it's my prayer that we will build relationships out from the walk we have with you, with others around us, in ways that bring your glory into this world, that we will see as our motivation in this life, proclaiming you more than anything else. In your name we pray, amen. See you guys next Sunday. Mm -hmm.